Welcome and thanks for listening to today's discussion about the chemistry of life. I'm going to be covering chapter two from your book and I'm going to try to get you up to speed on all the things that you'll need to know to move forward in this class. I'm going to skip the first part of the chapter about atoms because I think that's a review for almost everybody from either high school science classes or physical science, which most of you should have taken at the college level. I'm going to start on section 2.3, molecules. A molecule is just a group of atoms held together by some type of chemical bond. The three types of chemical bonds that we're going to cover are ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. Then after we talk about the different types of bonds, I'm going to talk about the properties of water, which is something that we all need to know and understand in order to understand biology and the chemistry behind biological systems or within biological systems. So ionic bonds are just bonds that are formed by the attraction of oppositely charged atoms or ions. If we remember from the past, an ion is a positively or negatively charged atom. So it's similar to a magnetic attraction. You can think of it in that way. And so this figure over here on the right hand side is showing the formation of table salt, or NaCl, which is an ionic compound, which just means that the, the bond holding the atoms together is an ionic bond. So if you look down here at the bottom, the sodium ion has a positive charge, and the chloride or chlorine ion has a negative charge. And those two are attracted to each other to form an ionic bond and the compound NaCl, or table salt. And like table salt, most molecules that are made up of ionic bonds are stable in a crystal form. Okay, so moving on to covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are going to be really important for understanding the next chapter when we talk about biological molecules. So covalent bonds are just types of bonds that are formed between two atoms where the electrons are shared. And covalent bonds are stronger than ionic bonds. And as we're going to talk about next, they are directional, or sometimes the electrons are shared unevenly between the atoms in the molecule. So this is just a picture showing the covalent bond between two hydrogen atoms in the molecular hydrogen, or H2. And this picture on the right-hand side, each of those little yellow circles, represents an electron, and they're shared. And the sharing of electrons in H2 brings each of the hydrogen atoms to a more stable state. Okay, so within a covalently bonded molecule, one atom may attract or pull the electrons closer to itself than the other atom or atoms in the compound. And what this does is, since electrons are negatively charged, the atom that pulls them closer to itself has a partial negative charge, which leaves the atom or atoms that have the electrons pulled away from them with a partial positive charge. A covalently bonded molecule where the electrons are shared unevenly is called a polar molecule. So a polar covalent bond is just a covalent bond where the electrons are not shared evenly. Then the last type of bond that I'd like to talk about is called a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is not a true chemical bond. It's a weak attraction between the positive part of a polar molecule and the negative part of a neighboring polar molecule. So you can think of this as somewhat similar to a magnetic bond. It's very, it's very weak though. But the effects of hydrogen bonding, especially in water, convey a lot of properties on water and determine how it acts in biological systems. So hydrogen bonding is extremely important to understand in order to understand 
the chemistry of life. Okay, so like I said earlier, a water molecule is a polar molecule, and because water molecules are polar, they can form hydrogen bonds with one another. If you look to the right hand side, this is figure 2.11 from your book. The oxygen atom is much larger than the hydrogen atoms and is able to pull the electrons closer to itself from each, than each of the hydrogen atoms. And so what happens is that the oxygen atom has a partial negative charge and the hydrogen atoms each have a partial positive charge. And so what happens then is that the positively charged hydrogen atoms are attracted to the negatively charged oxygen atoms. And this is this hydrogen bonding is what gives water a lot of its unique properties, which is what we're going to talk about next. Okay. So the hydrogen bonding in polar water molecules is responsible for the properties that we're getting ready to cover. The first property is heat storage, also sometimes referred to as high specific heat. And heat storage just means that water temperature changes slowly and water stays the same temperature for a long time. So it, it takes a lot of energy from the sun or another heat source to increase the temperature of water by even one degree Celsius. And in reverse, it takes a long time once water is heated up, it takes a long time for it to cool down. And so if you think about swimming in a lake that has had the sun beating down on it all day long, that water warms up. And once it gets toward dusk, and the sun is getting ready to go down or starts to go down and the air temperature cools off, if you decide that you're going to go for a swim in the lake, the lake water is still going to be much warmer than the air temperature is. And that is because of the high specific heat or the ability for water to store heat. And that works in reverse too. If the lake has cooled down all night and um, the sun's come up, up it's about 10 o'clock in the morning and it's starting to get hot outside the air's hot if you go jump in the lake the water temperature is still going to be much much cooler than the air temperature because it takes a lot of energy from the sun or a lot of heat from the sun to warm it back up so the next property is ice formation in water unlike some other liquids when water freezes because of the hydrogen bonding, it becomes less dense. And so that's because the hydrogen bonds don't allow the water molecules to pack really tightly together when they freeze. They kind of form this lattice um, pattern. And so if you think about it, if you were to fill up a water bottle all the way and stick it in your freezer with a cap on it, when you come back, if you let it stand there long enough to freeze, it's going to be broken, or if it's metal, probably just misshapen. The next property of water is that it has a high heat of vaporization, which just means that it takes a lot of energy to, for water to evaporate, and that is because before it can evaporate, the hydrogen bonds have to be broken. And when the water evaporates or vaporizes, it takes heat energy with it, causing evaporative cooling, which if you think about sweating and what happens when your sweat starts to dry, it cools you down. That's evaporative cooling. This is just a little drawing showing the pattern, the physical pattern of the water molecules as it freezes and, and becomes less dense. So the last two properties of water that are caused by hydrogen bonding are cohesion and adhesion. Cohesion just means that water molecules are attracted to one another and this is what allows for capillary action like water being pulled up through a straw because the water molecules cling to each other. They're able to be pulled up through a straw or up through a plant xylem tissue. And adhesion just means that water molecules are attracted to other polar molecules. And um, this actually also 
helps with capillary action because the water molecules cling to the sides of the xylem or the sides of the straw and it helps to pull them upward as well in that way. So please make sure that you know the five properties of water and understand that those are caused by hydrogen bonding, the five unique properties of water. And so th these are two other vocabulary words and concepts that I would like for you to take away from this chapter. Water is polar. And so what that means is that water tends to be attracted to and to mix well with and to dissolve other polar molecules. And this word hydrophilic, if you break it down, hydro means water, philic means to have an affinity for. And so polar molecules are hydrophilic, and that's just referring to the fact that they mix well with water. So that is something a concept that you're going to need to understand. And then the other thing um, that I wanted you to take away is to learn the meaning of hydrophobic and understand this concept. Hydro means water. Phobic, phobic means a fear of. And so um, molecules that are not polar are called nonpolar. And they do not mix well with water. So if you were to pour oil in water, it's, it's going to just kind of stick to itself in beads or in big round um, spots. And that's hydrophobic or, or scared of water. So non-polar molecules are hydrophobic or don't mix with water. And polar molecules are hydrophilic or mix with water. Okay, so the last thing that I'm, I'm not going to lecture on this, but I would like for you to review, because it should be a review, what pH is a measure of and understand the pH scale and what part of it is acidic and what part of it is basic and what is neutral. So make sure that if that, if you're not clear on all of that stuff, read that section of chapter two and make sure that you really understand it. And you can also, I have these PowerPoints in my Ozarka and you're welcome to review the PowerPoints in my Ozarka. And in fact, I recommend that you do. And so that is the end of today's lecture. And I hope that if you have any questions, you'll email me and definitely make sure that you've read this chapter in your book and that you focus on the part that is after atoms, unless you need to review the part about atoms. So by Tuesday afternoon, you can look for a lecture to be uploaded into Myozarka on chapter three. Thank you.